Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Wrench Turners podcast. Today we have a mechanic with over a decade of experience in the automotive industry and, like me, lots of experience on the shop floor. Lots. We, we, we've had people who are leaders, we've had people who are vendors, we've had people on the shop floor, we've had apprentices that are like brand new. We've got folks who have 50 years in the industry on this show. So you're going to get lots of tidbits from Travis Caldwell today show and then this is show is is as always the show it's about improving the life well-being and productivity of mechanics everywhere we've got folks listening from countries all over the world we've got over 40 countries listening we've got over 150,000 views which is all thanks to you thank you for watching thank you for listening thank you for sharing the show i appreciate it very much now travis thank you very much for giving us some time this evening thank i appreciate you, it very much appreciate it for having me on Awesome. So let's let's dive right into this. And and as we always do, we've got the the four things that we always want to answer to keep things consistent across all the shows. And the first question is always, what got you into the trade? What got me into the trade, man? That's kind of a loaded question. You know, growing up, having the dad in the driveway, you know, hold the flashlight. You're not holding it right. That's kind of how it started. Dad had an '87 Suburb. Yeah, it was an '87 Suburban, and you know, as well as I do, GM products were kind of hit or miss there. So he was always working on stuff, right? And I'd get mm -hmm. out there and crawl under the truck with him. And dad's first story he tells me is that I was two or three years old, get out up in the steer, uh, seat, started playing like I was driving the truck. And mom and dad's driveway is on a hill. Well, I happened to put it in neutral. And that thing went out back and went down the hill. So started kind of there and then just kept on going and in high school man it, it just i just kind of got drawn to it people were getting me to do car stereos doing tune-ups and stuff like that and it was never really a job it was just kind of something fun to do and, and and then you know it progressed as time went i had buddies that were racing uh, cross-country motorcycles and dirt bikes so I was helping them get their bikes running, going to races with them, you know, kind of the one man pit crew. And then mm -hmm. after that, it, it led into my buddy racing speeds and MotoGP. So was there, went off to college, had a job at a grocery store, wasn't really liking it there. And one day I happened to be in a Home Depot and I got to talking to one of the guys. He's like, hey, you want a job? you know, and started doing small engine repairs. Started doing that. Uh, and then I spent two, three years in college. College really wasn't for me, kind of like most people that end up in this industry. I, I was, you know, I wasn't going to class. Class wasn't really that for me. Uh, I was rather party. Called mom one day. I said, hey, mom, I enrolled at UTI. This is my start date. Went to UTI, was top of my class, almost every class. Um, UTI was great, man. I mean, it, you know, a lot of networking more than anything. I kind of had the basic know-how and skills. The electrical was really the big class that worked for me and got a better understanding. I know, you know, a lot of people struggle with electricity because they can't see it. I mean, it's it's not mm -hmm. a, it's not a hands-on thing. I did that. Was that something that you you had to you had to learn more outside of of UTI? Like, I'm I'm not because I'm not familiar with UTI. I didn't go. I've started to learn more about UTI as as we've had people on the show. We've had lots of folks who have gone to UTI that that have been on the show, and it sounds like the experience has all been fairly good all around. Was was your experience at UTI? really good was a really positive lots of lots of good feedback you said there was you know a lot of networking but networking doesn't sound like something that you are going to school right, for right right i mean but you know as well as i do you go to any school it's it's all about networking but uti all around was very positive it got you maybe those little things you didn't know or or, or things that you absolutely didn't know then they showed them to you if if I was to rearrange the curriculum of UTI, I think I would spend a little more time in each module. So, you know, engines, electrical, drivetrain, 
stuff like that. I would maybe make it a little longer. I know they're trying to get you in and out of there, but I think a little, a two week class is a little, a little too short, I think. But all around, I, man, I, UTI was awesome. UTI was awesome. Got to learn a whole bunch, had a whole bunch of great instructors and, and really and truly UTI was my stepping, stepping stone. If it wasn't for UTI, I wouldn't have, uh, interviewed with uh, Porsche's apprentice program and then got on with Porsche and did six months in, in, in Pennsylvania with Porsche, learning Porsche specifically. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people thought I was crazy when I went to Porsche because, well, why would you want to work on that? That's the most difficult thing to work on. Well, I think I'm just that kind of crazy that I, I like the difficult stuff. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want easy, right? You know, it makes you a better tech and Granted, I had to move up to the uh, northeast for uh, six months, and this uh, South Texas boy uh, did not know what snow was, so that was another <laughs> life experience right there. I got, <laughs> I love telling this story. So when I was at Porsche's PTAP program, I worked for a uh, Chevy Cadillac dealership, and I, honestly, that was probably the best experience in a shop that I had before I went to a shop. They put me with the master certified Cadillac tech. The first day I was there, he said, hey, look, you know how to turn wrenches. I'm not gonna teach you how to turn wrenches. I'm gonna teach you this business. And you know, as well as I do, this business is, it's, it's a different way of life, but it's a good way of life, as long as you know how to navigate it, I guess. And, and, and that's probably one of the best Best six months experience I had within the shop was just that mentorship. But when I got up there, it was October time frame, and they had found out I'd done small engine repairs. And they said, "Hey, Tex." They called me Tex. You, know, <laughs> you you know anything about snow blowers? So what the heck is a snow blower? You know, I've I'd seen them throughout throughout my hockey days, but I was like, "What the heck are y'all talking about?" So they had a little John Deere snowblower that had about a five horse on it. it. Says, "Man, we bought this thing and it hadn't run right from the get go." All right, so I get over there, I get it running like a top in, in, in no time. Well, come that Thanksgiving, our first snowfall, they said, "Hey, remember that snowblower? Yeah, you're you're pushing it now." I said, oh, "What do I do, man? All all I had was I had work boots. I didn't I didn't even have snow boots, so." You know, any water, my feet were wet. And that lot we were on was a big corner. It, uh, it probably about a half mile of sidewalk I had a snow blow. And mm -hmm. So <laughs> there was that. But then, you know, going back into the shop, that the master tech, he just, he showed me the way, man. And, and, and I, I think, I, I think and wish that most techs coming up in this trade could have a guy like that for, you know, six months, you sit under their wing and just show you the business. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a great, like I said, it's a great business, but it's, it's, it's a different business than, you know, you're serving your best buys or, or, or whatever like that. It's, it's a whole different career path. It, it, it's, a, it's a different beast, but if you understand it and know how to work it, it's a great life, man. It's it's a great life, but you know it really is. It really is. And and and, and oh, I, oh, go ahead. Can you stop whining down there? Out you go. If you're gonna whine, out. <laughs> so, well, it really is a great industry. Like there's a, and I like the fact that you bring up this again, and I, I'm going to try and highlight this as many times as I possibly can when, when folks on the show, that mentorship, especially in the first couple of years of your career as mechanic, especially as mechanic, having that person that can lead you through all of the challenges that you experience, because like he said to you, like, I, I'm not going to teach you how to, how to turn wrenches because that the, the actual act of it. The simple it is really simple. Functionally, it's very simple. There are there are some very specific techniques, 
for for all for a lot of things there are certain ways that you should and shouldn't use a hammer there are <laughs> ways that you should and shouldn't use any kind of wrench there are ways that you shouldn't should use any kind of screwdriver right but if you don't know the very specific technique on certain things you're never going to be able to turn turn out bolts and you're not going to be able to get out ball joints you're not going to be able to get those those are the things that a mentor is going to teach you he's not teaching you to turn the wrench he's te teaching you very specific skill sets right then he said himself i'm not going to necessarily teach you to the turn wrenches i'm going to teach you the business how to communicate how to work with a team how to work with service managers how to work with advisors how to communicate with these people to get the best out of them so they can so that you can give the best back absolutely right that part of learning the business is is an invaluable asset and those are things that come from mentors those are things that functionally speaking come from shop foremen leaders in the shop people who are willing to care about your well-being in this trade exactly and i think as we have a generation of people retiring as well as unfortunately a lot of senior technicians not getting a fair shake in terms of what shop they're working at they're not necessarily getting all the things that they need in order to be a top tier technician in their shop we're losing some of those those top tier potentially potentially top tier mentors out of the shop to teach the young folks coming in. And I don't necessarily mean just young folks, because I heard the other day there was a 35 year old just starting in the industry. Young, I, when I say young mechanic, they don't actually have to be young. They just have to be young in the trade. They're green, and they're green. Without, without the, the, the mentorship of someone who's been around for at least a decade, at least a decade, because even then a decade isn't really long enough. In my opinion, you get somebody 15, 20 years in the trade, they can teach you a lot. And if we lose that, it's gone forever, right? It's gone forever because all of the things that they've learned over the last hundred plus years is just gone. Oh, it is. It's just gone. And now that we have complexities coming into the cars, we've got EVs, we've got hybrids, we've got different fuels, we have all kinds of different computer systems adding layers on top of the mechanical stuff is just, we need those mentors. So to that end, that mentor brought you through a, a period of time in your career in the shop. What was that first year like? Was it just basically, you know, once you got out of because you know, the mentor was at the Chevy, uh, the Cadillac store before you got into the shop full time. So once you got into the shop, what was that first year at the shop like? So that first year I went to Baton Rouge, Louisiana of all places. And it was, it was the master tech the shop foreman, and then one other hourly guy. So there was only four of us in that shop. That first year, I was hourly. So I, you know, we, you talk about flat rate, you talk about stuff like that. I think that first year in the shop made it so much better being hourly that I wasn't worrying about, you know, making my 50 hours a week or something like that. But, you know, the shop foreman, the shop foreman had been with, with Porsche for, 30 plus years. So like you said, had, had that experience, had that knowledge, you know, and it was kind of one of those things. It wasn't like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to let you sink, but you know what? Take your time, figure out the processes and you figure it out. And if you have questions, that's, that's when you come ask me, but he, I'm not going to hold your hand and babysit you, but I'm going to let you learn and develop as a tech. And if I see you know, a bad habit or something like that, we're going to work on it and we're going to critique you to make you a more efficient tech, which, you know, now looking back between, between the Chevy house and, and, and then my first year with Porsche, if it wasn't for those two mentors, I couldn't sit here and tell you that I'm, I'm turning 180 hours every two weeks. I feel like I'd be lost that first year. That first year, it was a lot of trial and error. I mean, it was, you know, if you sat there and looked at the flat rate and you, it took, it pays three hours. It took you six hours. You're like, man, I'm losing my butt on it. But you know, with being that hourly guy, you, you learn it, you learn it, you learn the tips, mm -hmm. you learn the tricks. And it made, it made me a heck of a tech. I mean, it, it was, I think very beneficial. I, I know there was several guys that I went to PTAP with that they got thrown to the sharks. It was, Hey, here you go. Good luck. And those guys, mm -hmm. aren't, those guys aren't in the trade anymore. And mm -hmm. so I, th I think it's one of those things that you, you get that bad taste and it runs a lot of techs off. And like you were saying with the old guys, you start getting bad taste in your mouth, they're going to leave. And 
it, it's unfortunate because there's a lot of good techs that have left this industry and aren't able to sit and teach the younger kids coming up. And, and mm-hmm. I try my best, like the shop I'm at now, there's, we, we got a kid, a kid that he's, he's not, not on the line yet, but he's, he's learning the business. And I, I'm trying to take what the older generations taught me and passing it down. You know, it's, you got to help, help everybody, I think. Exactly. And I think that's where, again, I'll use the phrase again, and I say it as often as I can, you are not a leader until you've created a leader that can create another leader. So your, your, your mentor going back is a leader because he taught you enough and, and capable enough that you're now teaching another person to lead. And they're going to be utilizing that, that knowledge that your mentor acquired 30 years ago. Right. And that that succession of experience, of knowledge, of education, of all the things that you're going to teach them along the way, that's that's critical to the success of our industry. We are a trade. The trade is built on journeymen teaching apprentices. That is what our foundation is built on and built around. When we don't have that consistently throughout the process, we lose The trade, we become something completely different. We become a Best Buy because it's just get people in at minimum wage, work them as hard as you possibly can. If they leave, oh, well, our our churn rate is this and it is what it is. We'll just get another person off the street. That is not how this trade is built. It's not how it's designed. We are working on really complex systems on really complex vehicles with multiple systems with layers of all kinds of different technologies and 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 systems. We have hydraulics, we have electrics, we have fluid dynamics, we have interiors. My God, dealing with interiors. That is an entire thing on its own. If you're good at interiors, bless your heart. I am not that person. I am the person, I am the first person to admit, I'm going to be the guy that breaks the clips. I'm going to be the guy that breaks the clips. And I'm going to be the guy walking to the parts department and going, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Parts person, I need one of these. You can't get that. (laughs) What do you mean you can't get that? Well, that clip, you have to order a thousand of them. I'm not ordering a thousand of those clips because you're the only one that breaks them. So guess what? It's a panel that you now have to replace. Right? And I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy. Don't come to me for interior stuff. People have asked me about interior stuff over my my career. No. I'm going to stay away as far away from that as humanly possible. Now, I've had to do my fair share of interior work, pulling dashes on Grand Cherokees to do heater cores and blowers, and oh my god, it just makes me (laughs) cringe. But I had the conversation in the group chat earlier, we were talking about headlights, and Marshall was talking about, why are you going to pull off a bumper to change a headlight? Well, he's talking about the whole assembly, but I digress. And I go back back 20 years, I'm talking about Grand Cherokees, when you got, you either pulled the bumper off and the headlight out, to change a bulb or you cut a panel inside so you can change a bulb that's asinine yeah that is asinine yeah. but those are the things you have to learn in your career over time there are all kinds of things that are like that over time and now let me this is brought up another story i'm just thinking i'm going down a rabbit hole on stories here a little bit but i recall a time where what's the story this is second hand folks so so bear with me a little bit i work with a gentleman by the name of andrew many years ago, and he used to work heavily on Audis. And I understand that in Audis on RS6s and S6s, the way the bi-turbo works, uh, common faults were O2 sensors. Upstream O2 sensors were common faults. And in order to get them out, there wasn't a whole lot of room. You either had to drop subframe, drop engine to replace these things because you had to, the way the bolt structure was working for from header to downpipe was just ludicrous. But if you happen to have a small individual in the shop, somebody with thin hands, thin arms that could reach up, they could do it if they fit. But most of us who are in this industry (laughs) don't have small hands, don't have small forearms, so it gets stuck part of the way. So you can't get anything in. So he had his thin fellow that would get in there and do the upstream oxygen sensors for you. Anyway. I digress. Let's maybe let's let's not go down the rabbit hole a little bit too much before I defend somebody. It's funny you say that about a small-handed person. So when I was in Baton Rouge, I had they we got another kid from PTAP, the apprentice program with Porsche, and he came in. He was a smaller gentleman, and they put him with me. 
So I started mentoring him, and he, he'll tell you this story through and through. When I needed to get my hands in somewhere tight, I'd call him over. Hey, get over here. So after I left back. Special service to a human number one. Oh, yeah. And, and actually, actually, we're uh, we're working on a year of his, his wedding anniversary. We were up in Missouri last year for his wedding. I gifted him a wrench that uh, when he was my apprentice, he marked with the uh, positive uh, post on a Panamera. So it has a, it has a weld mark on it. So uh, that's that's a keepsake for him now. But then I moved back to Dallas, and I, I, I'm originally from Dallas, Fort Worth, so moved back to Dallas. So I pulled him up to Dallas to work with me, so I had my small hands again. So <laughs> I, I kind of dra- I kind of dragged him around. But like you said, you know, you, you start teaching these kids, leading them to start teaching kids. And I think he's a foreman up in Missouri now somewhere. So, you know, it, that's it's awesome. It's like seeing your children grow up. You know, That's exactly it. It makes, exactly you, it makes you kind of proud. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you've been at Porsche for a long time and worked on a lot of stuff. What was? What would you say, what's your favorite Porsche? And the opposite end of that spectrum, what's your least favorite Porsche to work on? So I'll start with my least favorite, the original Cayenne, the 9PA. I, that, that thing, I want to say Porsche makes everything grand and great. When I'd be lying mm-hmm. if I told you that that thing was it was great when it first came out, but like any other German vehicle, it did not age well. And you know, I've made lots of money on it, and I can't knock it for that. But that thing had problems after problems after problems, and you know, I can revert back to one one Cayenne that ate my lunch, and it ate my lunch for a while. You know, when those cars originally came out, Porsche didn't have online SI. It was mm-hmm. still all paper, so you had mm-hmm. to go find the book. So it had it had a throttle body fault. I can't remember the code exactly, but it said, first, replace throttle body. If not, replace DME. So, replace throttle body, fault still there. Replace DME. Mm-hmm. Fault still there, but now the vehicle would not start. Lovely. And me and the foreman, the foreman was a guy that had been with the company since the inception of Porsche. I mean, he, he'd been around for uh-huh. years. He started scratching his head. I was scratching my head. We were calling, and you know, you can't really call tech assist at this point because this, this point, this Cayenne was 15, 16 years old at the time so they're not going to be any of help it ate my lunch ate my lunch we started pulling steering column immobilizers i mean we got to everything mind you i'd gone and got with parts to make sure that this dme was the correct dm mm-hmm. three months later we come to find out the dme was the wrong dme oh god so I I chase this car, and the funny thing is, is I found this out because I had left. I got out of the industry. Uh, I went to build elevators because I I got out of the industry for a little bit. I was I was working seven days a week, and if if I have any advice to anybody coming up in this industry is do not let work control your life. I was mm-hmm. I was seven days a week, man. I was I was sun up, sun down, and into the next morning working. And I got so burnt out, so I left for a little bit. And when I left, one of my buddies in the shop, he called me a few weeks later. He goes, "Hey, you like Cayenne? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it was a DME. It was a bad DME. Wrong part number. Always, always, always check parts." Parts guys are your your average guys for the most part that you know they they don't have a lot of experience on the line so they mess up I mean we all mess up it's human but always always check part numbers because <laughs> you're in a world of hurt if if you've got the wrong part you start chasing it for three months and it doesn't take much either I've I've seen seen it myself not necessarily hit DME. But I've seen myself where you look at part numbers and sometimes the printing on the part number isn't good. And a B could be an 8. Yep. 
right? It could be that stupid. Yeah. Like you can look at it and, and go, they've, they've changed. Like you don't think anything of it, right? You don't think anything of it. You don't. And you just look at it and go, well, that's, that looks right. And you've checked it. You thought you've checked it. You thought you've checked it with somebody else. And it's, it's figment of your imagination or just an interpret, just an interpreted thing of some description where you're looking at it going, you know what? You just think that it looks right, right? It looks, it looks right. It looks right. And then you, and then you go through what you've gone through so much so that you left and find out that it's still wrong after you left. Yeah. Like those are the kinds of things that, that nightmares are made of, right? They're absolutely nightmares and there's not a whole lot you can do about them, to be honest, because, you know, you think about things like Six Sigma. Right, the whole premise behind the Six Sigma is one like a Motorola, I think that came up with it originally many, 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 many years ago. And you're talking about one failure in a hundred thousand is what they were looking for, right? That decimal zero 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 one. If they can get it to that point, their their gross profit will be better. And you know, think now how they use the Six Sigma. It, so it's one in a hundred thousand. That still means that you have a failure in a hundred thousand. And if you produce 100,000 or 200,000 or 300,000 or 400,000 of these, units, that's still four failures in 400,000 units. Now, does anybody ever accomplish Six Sigma? No. Nope. No. No. Nope. Motorola themselves could not get to Six Sigma. They, in, they created this whole process and they themselves couldn't achieve it in, in a completely sterile environment for all of the things that they, they did. Completely sterile, process, process, process down to minutia granular level and they still couldn't so what are you talking about you're talking 10 per hundred thousand that's one in ten thousand well we know how many units all of these cars are produced across the world you're talking about ford f-150s are produced i think if i'm not mistaken i could be wrong somebody can fact check me it's like one f-150 every 37 seconds and how many parts are on an f-150 no right so you're talking about hundreds of thousands of units even if they're at five, at the five decimal place, whatever it is, one in 10,000, how many of those things are just going to fail? Because some infinitesimally small granular out of place or something ridiculous like that. So mistakes can happen. Failures can happen. Parts failures can happen. Something could be actually just wrong with the thing that they've sent you brand new and you're pulling your hair out. And unfortunately it happens, <laughs> but this is where we get back to having shop leadership shop foremen, experienced technicians, high value leaders, as I call them. Those are the people that can turn that nightmare into something that you can A, learn from, and B, still get a paycheck at the end of the week. Because those are the people that are gonna help you get through it. It prevents the resentment. It prevents the bitterness. It prevents leaving because those are the people who are there to support you. If they are not supporting you, that's why we have technicians leaving. That's why I say there's really only two reasons why technicians leave this industry. Either it's them or a bad leader. Because realistically speaking, you could say, you know, you can talk about flat rate, you can talk about warranty times, you can, you can complexities, training, communication. There's all kinds of things that you can talk about. It really only comes down to two things, the technician or the leadership. Because a good leader will fix all of those problems. Yeah. They really will. And, you know, and if they can't fix all of those problems, it's going to be the tech. I'm calling you out. So no, you're we've, not. we've both dealt with that. I think everybody's dealt with folks who assume the worst and it's always somebody else's fault. And that is a problem. That is one of the things that we need to deal with in this industry. And I'm really hopeful that the show is, is doing a portion of that because we need to teach each other how to communicate. We need to teach how to lead. We need to teach. We need to build more leaders to be able to, to be mentors like you had 30 years in the industry. You know, you're the, the Chevy master, the Cadillac master tech that taught you while you weren't even full time in a shop yet. Those are the people we need to build more of. Right. And it takes the entire industry to do that. So to that point, so you left the left the industry a little bit, built elevators. Why did you come back to the industry? It's, it's, I guess, I guess the be best, uh, it's like that ex-girlfriend that was that, that crazy ex-girlfriend you just can't get over. It, it drew me back in. I had actually met my wa now wife uh, when I was building elevators. I was still in Dallas, Fort Worth. She lived in South Texas. Um, 
So I moved down here. This it, it's a very small market compared to Dallas Fort Worth. You, you know, th- this this town's only three hundred fifty thousand people uh, compared. Oh, to, oh right. <laughs> well, so from the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, where I think there's like eight million people or something like that. Uh-huh. So and and up there there was four or five Porsche dealerships in the Dallas Fort Worth, Fort Worth Metroplex at this point. So moved down here. Elevators were not a thing down here. So I went, I went, I went back into the industry and uh, went to Volkswagen because mother Volkswagen, it called mm-hmm. you in. Uh, and I, I spent, I spent six, seven months with Volkswagen and, uh, it just, the management wasn't correct. The atmosphere wasn't correct. And, and that's another thing is, is you've got to find that atmosphere that you jive with you, you. I mean, it's a brotherhood. It's, you know, when I was in Dallas with Porsche, it was Friday nights. All the guys were going out and we called them team bonding nights, but we all just go out and have a drink or two. And, it, you know, but we all is a brotherhood you, and growing up playing hockey. I lost that when I quit playing hockey. So I found it in the shop and it made going to work a lot better. And down here, it just wasn't there. I didn't see eye to eye management. And, and like you said, management makes or breaks a lot of places. And, and they, they promised me the moon. and It wasn't here. I, I had a uh, manager that uh, uh, been in the industry for a long time. Knew, I, I respect his knowledge, but he'd only been with a German motor vehicle company, the Volkswagen Group, for a total of six months. And mm. he used he used, well, in my 30 years of experience. Yeah, that right off the rip. It doesn't matter how – I give my own, my own experience to that effect. I got 20 years in automotive, around automotive. The last couple of years, I spent some time in power sports fixing, fixing bikes and fixing ATVs and stuff like that to get myself contextualized. A lot of it's the same. A lot of it's, you know, from a mechanical standpoint, there's a lot different. Like working on sleds is a completely different animal than to working on anything else. What's a sled? Working on sleds is a – What's the sled? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Snowmobile. What's snow? What's Southern snow? He doesn't know what a sled is. Working on snowmobiles. For those of you that have not seen snow. <clears throat> anyway, working on sleds is a completely different animal to working on anything else. Like, it's really, really, really different. Now, working on ATVs is just like working on a small car. Would, would snowmobiles be like almost, I mean, other than having tracks and sleds, would it be almost to the extent of a jet ski? No, 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 no. Be in, 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 how do, how do I simply describe without spending 20 minutes? So snowmobiles, for the most part, there's, there is four strokes, but most of it is two strokes. Okay. Okay. There is a transfer case to take it to the track and then you have tracks and the way the transfer case works is it goes through. So everything is a challenge and tight and small and it's two stroke and everything is difficult to get to because everything's compact and it needs to be to try and keep it light and weight distribution and so on and so forth. And because everything is so compact, nothing pays very well because you do a lot of, there's a lot of warranty because there's not a whole lot to do. There's not a whole lot to do in terms of maintenance because again, we're talking about something that is really, really, really not driven a lot for the most part, unless you're in snowbound country like nine months of the year and you can ride the snowmobile nine months of the year, they don't get used a lot, which means they coke up quite easily. So maintenance is plugs and keep it clean, right? And keep the valves clean, you're, you're good for the most part. Make sure everything's adjusted, good. But when it comes to failures, you're taking everything apart. Like, you're taking everything apart. Whereas a jet ski is a different animal again, where you're basically, you can take a lot apart. Well, you can take some apart while it's still in it. But now, you gotta, if you have to get deep, you got to take the whole unit out of, out of the bloody boat. Right. Right? And it's in even tighter space. I don't understand how some of these folks are, are doing like aftermarket modifications and putting turbos and stuff on these things because there's almost no space to begin with. So I don't know how they're doing that, but some of that stuff's crazy even again, right? There is, there's stuff that's similar. There's stuff that there's the same. And then there's stuff that is completely different. And 
that applies to service and to sales, right? My own experience with the bike recently, anybody that's watching, watching the stuff that I'm doing, the vlog stuff out in the shop, right? my experience with, with bikes, my goodness, they can have a fleet. Like say I wanted to go out and buy a, um, a new hundred, a new thousand CC bike, new leader bike from Honda, you know, a fire blade. Let's say they got 15 of on the shop on, on the sales floor. If they don't have a demo bike, you can't ride one. If you go to any car dealership, if it's on the lot, you can drive it. Get in it. See how it feels. Go for a test drive. You can't do that on a bike. Unless there's a demo bike. And considering bikes are not produced in the quantities of cars, sometimes limited supply is the normal. Right on a bike like a, a thirty-five thousand dollar Honda Fireblade, there's not many of them out there because there's not too many people that can afford a thirty-five thousand dollar toy, right? So that's a whole different ball of wax, and we won't go deep into that here today. But you're back into the industry. Let, let's let's try and get keep ourselves back on track here, folks. Let's try and keep this back on track. So yeah. Travis has got back into automotive and he's working at a Volkswagen store where there's obviously a fit issue. And we say on the show all the time, find a leader you want to work for and make sure you fit well with the team. That is the most important thing that you need to find as a mechanic before pay, before benefits, before everything. Make sure you find a leader that you want to work for and want to lead and be led by somebody who's going to support you and provide you the resources that you need. Then find your fit. Does the team jive with you and then figure out all the rest because everything else can be it's a lot easier to take a you know a dollar two less an hour if you know the team is going to be super supportive right it is it super is. supportive so that's obviously you didn't find that i did so so we how did you transition from a store that wasn't working out too well I, to yeah, where you are now where you have you know so believe it or not still in the industry but a whole different ball game of i'm doing eight ass calibrations now so your adaptive cruise okay. control, your blind spots and stuff like that. But in the process of transferring to that, I started recognizing down here that there's a bunch of Porsche, Audis, Mercedes. I mean, there's a, there's there's German cars down here, but the nearest dealerships, other than having a BMW dealership and a Mercedes dealership, the nearest Porsche, Audi dealerships are two, two and a half hours away. Well, mm -hmm. most people that drive a Porsche or Audi don't have the time to be driving two and a half hours one way to sit. And then most of these dealerships aren't giving you a loan car to drive two hours back. So in the process mm -hmm. of, of, of switching over to where I'm at now doing ADAS calibrations, I've started, started working on opening my, our own shop for Porsche and Audi. And, and you know, the, the small market has kind of limited me to, to where I can. So now I'm starting to branch out to where I'm doing Fords. Mm -hmm. My father-in-law has a whole fleet of Ford uh, diesels. So I, I stay busy with those. Let me just say that. Yeah. I know I'm going to upset a few Power Stroke fans here, but I stay busy with those. I think there isn't too many things that are on the road right now, whether it's, it doesn't matter which one of the big three it is. They, they keep us, us mechanics busy right from the factory. They keep us busy. So let's dive into that a little bit deeper. So this is a, a common one thing I see in comments on posts online. I've had comments in my DMS on LinkedIn talking about it. You know, I should just go open my own shop. You know, I should just do this. I'm, I'm way better and da, 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 da. Statistically speaking from a business standpoint, Move away from the fact that we're mechanics fixing things for a second. Doesn't matter how good you are at fixing things. It does not matter how good you are at fixing a vehicle. Because when you introduce customers and you now own a business, you now have to figure out how to fix customers. So as part of your journey in this, what are the things that you've had to learn that you have never had to do before or um, have only, you know, smatterings of it over your career as a mechanic that you now have to learn running your own business, fixing cars. Uh, the, uh, the biting the tongue has been the biggest one. And I know, I know that sounds kind of cliche, but you know, as mechanics, you, you get those ROs of, uh, phone won't connect to, 
uh, charger or something like that. And, you know, you just want, you want to sit there and say, hey, dummy, your, mm-hmm. your cable doesn't work now. But now, you know, going into depth and, and, and not crossing that line and being as respectful as you can and, and not cross that line of just straight up calling them a dummy. <laughs> it, it, that's That's been a big learning curve for me. But, you know, it, it, it's something that... Because that's layered. Because why do you, keeping your mouth shut is a skill. If through and through, it's a skill. And it's a skill we, need, we, we would all benefit, all of us, doesn't matter who's listening, we would all benefit from learning how to keep our mouth shut in more important circumstances. Well, absolutely. The next portion of that is, I like the example you gave, because that, that elicits something that we have to deal with as mechanics in dealerships all the time. And we have customers who come in who make a complaint to the service advisor and the service advisor, unless they've got like 15 solid years in the business and the dealership has really awesome, amazing processes and great leaders, they're simply going to write the complaints on the work order, thinking nothing of it. We have a customer, we have a car, we have a complaint. Let's, let's be as thorough as we can describe the complaint and then the technician's going to look at it. Well, that complaint might, as you say, might be completely dumb be absolutely asinine and it still gets in the shop in a dealership if you as a technician look at it and go well this is ridiculous this is simple and it's like boop 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 done and it has there really shouldn't be any charge time to the customer on it at all the dealership can eat that because more than likely there's three four five other lines in the work order you're going to make your money on it or conversely the leader is going to go oh you spend half hour on this this isn't really something that we can charge a customer for i'll, I'll make well I'm, I'll, I'll put i'll put on 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 internal and i'll pay you the half hour whatever whatever they could afford to do that now that you're running your own shop as it were making a service call to someone for something that's dumb that you don't know is actually dumb until you get there on site how do you deal with those things that you really shouldn't charge a customer for? Man, it, I've kind of learned that if if, if uh, you give a cookie, you'll get a pie in return sometimes. Um, mm-hmm. I, I had a gentleman that uh, he had a uh, 86 944 Porsche, and I think I charged him $75 for an oil change. Mm-hmm. Definitely lost my hind end with with, with that. Mm-hmm. But guess what? He came back with his Cayenne, his wife's BMW X3, you know, and those paid in the end. You know, trying to explain that to my wife, who's more financially and business smart, she's like, well, why did you just, why did you give away work for nothing? So because mm-hmm. you treat people right, they're going to come back. And then they're going to tell your friends. So, it, it, you know, you sometimes have to bite your tongue and, and, and take it on the chin. And it, it's more more than not, it's going to pay off in the end. They'll, they'll come more back. More often than not. And this is where we need to teach the rest of our brotherhood and sisterhood in the industry. There is a line. There is a line. And at, there is a certain point when... Dealerships and shops alike, doesn't matter whether it's independent, franchise independent, or, or dealership, there is a line. And leadership should understand that line just as well as the mechanic on the floor should. And it's that line where any mechanic, and I've done it, like you said, I, I love the phrase, give a cookie, get a pie. You can only give so many cookies. You're right. The difficulty I have with mechanics who talk to me about that same mentality of you have to give to receive the giving without expectation is how do i know i'm going to get back well that's the point of giving you don't however if you haven't clearly communicated your boundaries and your leadership hasn't clearly communicated their expectations you will never get anything in return so it's on us as the individuals to communicate what they what we are and what we are not willing to do in terms of what we're willing to give. Exactly. So if you get that car that's got 15 lines on it and 14 of them are customer concerns, that should be an immediate and professional conversation. A, 
this is this vehicle is a year old. It's under warranty. Which means anything that I find wrong is going to be covered by warranty. But it also means that if I find nothing wrong and I actually spend my time on this properly and do my job properly, I'm not going to do very well because we can't charge warranty for it. So what is the best course of action going forward on this repair so that we can keep the customer happy? Because ultimately speaking, the customer pays our wages. How do we keep the customer happy? How do we communicate effectively? And I don't lose. Well, it, that, if you're having that kind of conversation all the time, there's a problem. But if you have that professional conversation up front, they know your boundaries and your expectations, and they on they should also then communicate their expectations to you. That way, you don't get taken advantage of, and that way, you don't become bitter. It, it, well, and that and that goes back to the, the the Volkswagen dealership I was at. You know, you'd end up with seven, eight lines of customer concern that was CP. They were charging them one hour of diag for seven lines. Uh, and that's and that's you know at that point it's like hey. We can't be doing this. I, I understand you want to help the customer out, but you, there's, I got to get paid, especially when it's something that is, you know, hey, the 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 uh, AC is not blowing. Okay, well, we need to see if we got a charge. We got to see if what what's not working. I mean, that's that's an hour of time right there, evacuating and recharging just to make sure that we have the proper pressure in the system. I, mm -hmm. you know, and then well, uh, I mean it. it rattles rat german cars are rattle machines and, and you know uh i became very proficient at it in my uh hourly days with porsche uh i put mm -hmm. 750 miles on one car to find a rattle uh, i have no doubt I've, I've been there i've had apprentices in the trunk of cars man i've had apprentices in the trunk of cars man like both prank, prank and professionally, I've had apprentices in the trunk of the car to try and find stuff. It's a little, and I would not, I would not get in a trunk unless it was my baymate driving, because I don't trust anybody else to do it. But to that end, I've had to get in trunks of stuff. I've had to get into listening ears. I've had every accoutrement known to God and man to try and find rattles. And sometimes it is the most asinine thing that you will ever imagine that things make noise. To that effect, when you were at Porsche, now this is, this is me trying to, to, to relate between the two because the best experience I had with noise, vibration, and harshness was at Ben's. Ben's supplied the shop floor and more specifically the foreman who controlled all the special tools. We had a box, an entire box but it wasn't just a mismatch box. It was a, a properly built professional box. There was like 12 different kinds of felt. There was like 12 different kinds of lubricants. There was different stiffening devices as it were. There was different softening devices as it were. There were cleaners all in the name. And each one of them had their own part number. Each and every one of them had their own part number that you could figure out and or use depending on the material you were working with. So A, you had to find the noise and then, okay, what materials are we talking about? Are we talking about a plastic to plastic? Are we talking about rubber to plastic? Are we talking about metal to plastic? Are we talking metal to, to leather? What noise is it? And that determined what piece of the noise vibration and harshness you would use. Is Porsche similar? Did they have something similar? So one of our actually biggest rattle, or it was actually a CD. It was a CD that would you would put in for different bass tones, different pitches in the radio because a lot of it was door panels. But you had the kits for you know felts and stuff like that. At one point there was a it was a TSB about the gas tanks rattling, just shifting within the metal bands. Well, they had a kit, but it was on back order. So you know what you did? You went and got some of the moving or the pads that go on the bottom of furniture pads to slide mm -hmm. on floors. And that's what you put up there. That's that, that's what the TSB told you to do. Furniture pads. Yeah, furniture pads. But I, I'm sitting here at my toolbox and I'm I'm trying to find the. Uh, Special, special sauce, as we called it, or you know as well as I do, uh, the German, uh, huh? it, I just called it hemoglobin, glopping, glooping, glooping, or something like that, uh, because there was, you know, it, it was a mile and a half long name, 
and, and, and a little uh-huh. bottle was about seven hundred dollars. But yep, I've no doubt. But that thing, I've no would, doubt, that thing would, that thing would fix rather, especially seats. Seats would rub on the cayenne mm-hmm. between the you know the the uh, cup holder fold down or, or one of the oscillating. Mm-hmm. You just rub a little on that leather and massage it, and bam, that rattle go away. But that's crazy. It, yeah. it works. The right kind of fluid, the right kind of materials, the right kind of whatever, it works. It does. It At the does. end of the day, that's, you're, you're trying to solve a, a concern for the customer. Take care of them. And I, I guess that's that, that leads us into the last question here. So you've had special service tools. You've been in the industry a long time. You've had a mentor, mentors, plural. Um, you've been out. You've been back in. You're now uh, doing your own thing, trying to keep customers happy and, and make some money while doing it. What would you say would be your number one piece of advice for a technician out there to be happier, healthier, more productive? I think we're kind of we're going to go back back on it. Is is first don't don't let work control your life. That's that's why I got out. I mean, you know, like I said, seven days a week. I mean, the work was there, and you know as well as I do, when the work's good, get the work while you can, because there's going to be dry days. But there becomes a point where it makes you so unhappy that you don't even want to go into the shop. You don't want to pick up a wrench. And I, I truly, you know, everybody says, oh, I don't believe in that. Find, uh, find something you love because you'll never work a day in your life. I took a passion and, and turned it into a career. And there for a while, yeah, I did hate. I hated it. I hated it. I didn't even want to do my own oil changes. I didn't even want to put air in my tires. That, you know, I was at that point with. But don't let your work vindicate your life and don't let it control it. And find that mentor. Find somebody to show you the ways. You know, that the going back to my mentor with Caddy, he taught me, hey, look, when you're doing an oil change, you put that wrench in your back pocket. And until that wrench is up, and if that wrench is not up, you don't know if you tighten that drain bolt. I mean, mm-hmm. You find those rhythms, you find those processes. Don't don't think you're the Superman in, in lifting transfer cases in and out or transmissions in and out because it you know nowadays people are working until they're 70, 80 years old. You don't want to have a bad back at 35, 40 years old. 50. Oh yeah, well and, and, and you know my mentor he he had a back brace on and he was 50 and I'm like I ah, I don't want to be that guy. I you know I don't mm-hmm. want to be. I can't get up in the morning to go to the restroom or I can't get out of bed because this industry took it from me. But mental health and, and physical health is, is is the key to this career, this this line of industry is, you know, take care of yourself. Don't let this industry kill you because gotcha. it, 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 it will. It will. But, you know, find find some. Find a shop that fits as well, where 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 that camaraderie, that brotherhood is good. Find good service riders. I mean, service riders, believe it or not, you know, you get a bad service rider, you're not going to make money. Find a good mm-hmm. service rider that can, you know, can explain explain to the customer what's going on. If you if you have a service rider that says, "Hey, uh, Mr. Customer, uh, your alternator's bad." Well, what does my alternator do? I don't know. That's what the how many how many of oh my goodness we could have stories. I'm sure there are so many stories that we all have of those. I think the big thing about service advisors, much like apprentices, in the same way, you've got to find the ones with a good attitude and the right. They got to carry themselves a certain way, right? Because you can teach mechanics. We can teach them the things they need to know in order how to communicate properly to. A customer like if they need a little bit more technical knowledge we can teach them like there's nothing wrong with us teaching them you know people say well it's not my job well well guess what if if we can find a way that benefits everyone including ourselves if we can find a way to, to benefit everyone it will benefit the customer and if it's benefiting the customer the customer is going to pay the tab right so well great it, piece of advice it, and like you said that's not my job well, honestly, at the end of the day, it is your job because guess what? That guy up there sitting on the service drive uh, is what writes your paycheck. So you mm-hmm. know, don't 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 take that mentality of it's it's not my job. 
teach that guy. I, and I, real quick, I mean, you know, I had a service rider when I was at Volkswagen that came in, green as green can be, never written service in his life. I couldn't stand the guy. Could not stand him because he couldn't sell water to a fish kind of thing, you know. And I, he'd come out there and he'd want, he'd, you know, he wanted an explanation on this or that or he'd, you know, and I wanted to beat him across the head. But I spent the time and helped him. Now he's service manager of, of, of that dealership. So it's like, you know, take that time and help, help your service riders. Let them understand what's going on. Because like I said, end of the day, that's, that's your paycheck right there. And if you got a guy that's and on that bombshell, that's that's a great way to to leave that to bit because there's about six or seven in there to to pull away from folks. Teaching your service advisor might be the best way to improve your paycheck. It just might be, it just might be. Travis, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for giving us some time this evening. I really appreciate it. Always I'm hoping that a uh, whole bunch of you out there listening and and watching got some good tidbits out of there too. So thank you very much again. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Folks, I think that's the end of another episode of Wrench Turner's podcast. I really hope you enjoyed. I really hope that you subscribe as well and share to your friends and family, especially those folks that you think are more mechanically inclined. Please do share. And as a, we end the show, as we always do, with a bit, bit of a quote, and I think this might be, uh, again, in, I've, I've done this like four or five times in a row, and, and I love it because I pull these quotes, what I think and, and feel on the day, and We've got an episode where we're talking about giving a cookie and getting a pie in return. And this quote here, to give without any reward or any notice has a special quality of its own. And Moral Lindbergh, gotta love it. Remember, folks, negative pushes, positive pulls, and always clean your toys before you put them away. <laughs>